Here's one that's going to drive some people crazy. What would happen if I came to you and said the entire environmental impact of that cloth cotton bag you carry to the grocery store, you have to use 7,100 times to basically equal the plastic bags that are produced out of natural gas. Yet we walk around with our little plastic bags when we walk into the Trader Joe's or those things, you know, proudly showing, hey, I care about the environment. But the math, that's not the science. If we're going to make public policy, how does this body, how every from, and, and not only Congress, but our city councils, our county governments, our state legislatures, how do we stop making public policy that's virtue signaling? And the math is the math. We have this incredible report, detailed, came out of, I think, um, Denmark, that was looking at the environmental impact. Turns out, those crappy little plastic bags that are banned in so many of our cities were less environmentally impactful than the cotton bags we're walking around with, because those cotton ones you've got to use 7,100 times to actually have the same environmental impact. Another one that's going on around the country right now is let's ban natural gas for cook stoves and heating in homes. Except if you actually do the math of burning natural gas to, turn, to make steam, to turn the turbine, to make electricity, it actually is environmentally substantially better environmentally to use natural gas in your home. I mean, it, it, and there's lots of really good studies and data on this. But once again, it's sort of this urban folklore, it's, it's virtue signaling to say, my city council is gonna ban natural gas from people being able to cook with. It, aren't I doing something wonderful for the environment? But it turns out, no, you're not. We have gotta stop doing this. So, there's actually some other really interesting ones. So how many out there did we watch on the cable news shows after the functioning canceling of the Keystone Pipeline? Now, as Republicans, we all talked about the jobs lost. On the left, they are talking about the environmental benefit of stopping that pipeline. Well, if you want to just do, oh, first, let's deal with the reality. Those hydrocarbons are going somewhere. They're going to be cracked somewhere, turned into distillates or fuels if they're refined in Southeast Asia or find in Louis, refined in Louisiana or Texas. They're going to be refined. So let's just do the math on the transportation. Turns out the Keystone Pipeline has dramatically less carbon impact then sticking it in a rail, sticking it into um, the rail pipeline attachment, or sticking it in rail or pipeline and putting it on the coast and shipping it out to Southeast Asia, just the shipping part. If you actually cared about the actual math of environmental impact of the Keystone Pipeline, you would have supported the pipeline. But that wasn't the virtue signaling that came from the environmental community. And look, I, being someone who genuinely cares a lot about the actual math, you know, as, as those of us who try to do the math of what is the actual impacts in global warming and what is actually the folklore, what is make-believe, what is real, we got to stop doing this. And I know we love the political wedges, saying, well, they supported this and we supported the union workers and they... How do you get some people around the table to use a calculator and say, well, it turns out, whether you like hydrocarbons or not, the pipeline turns out to have a less environmental load than canceling it does because now we're going to stick it in rail cars. Now we're going to ship it to other parts of the world. And I haven't even done the math on other refineries from other parts of the world have had dramatically less environmental standards when cracking carbon chains. So here's another one. Can I grab the binder? Now this one actually is 
both hopeful, but we're going to have to start to think a little more creatively. So here's my setup. Half the non-carbon emitting electricity in the United States, actually I think it's slightly more than half, comes from nuclear, baseload nuclear. We have a massive amount of our baseload nuclear that's coming offline. If you actually do the math of the amount of nuclear that's coming offline, our renewable baseload cannot keep close to keeping up. So there's a lot of charts, we, and I've done this on the floor before, showing that as all this nuclear comes offline, carbon emissions in the United States on electrical generation is going up. Even though we have all this renewable, this wind, this photovoltaic, these things, um, geothermal, hitting the market, it doesn't produce enough power to keep up with the nuclear coming off. And the argument for much of the nuclear is, well, think they have to do uranium mines. Think of this. Think of that. Well, what if I came to you and said, baseload nuclear is absolutely critical to the reliability of the grid and all those other things, and it's non-carbon emitting, and we have the technology today, and I've done a whole presentation on this in detail, of basically we can extract uranium from seawater now. We do this. We have the technology. But it's even better than that. We have a Nobel Prize physicist who's been writing papers articles saying within a decade they believe high and it's high well sorry let's put it the right side up so I'm not holding upside down high pulse lasers and, and look I, I've done my best to read the scientific articles a couple times some of it's beyond even you know when you're having to read an article and you know have a dictionary close by to look up some of the technical but his premise is we can use high pulse lasers to break up and make inert spent nuclear fuels. So his theme is, hey, in 30 minutes, I can take something that would have lasted a million years, and in 30 minutes, I can make it inert. If this is tr true, it's the virtuous cycle on nuclear energy. And you all know, because this place has actually helped fund it, the new compact nuclear design, reactor design, that's dramatically safer, dramatically less intrusive, and much more efficient. So think of that. I can extract my uranium from seawater, the new nuclear reactor designs, and now we have a way of instead of sticking it in Yucca Mountain, we can actually break up that nu spent nuclear fuel. This should be exciting. There should be people on the left and the right going, it is worth sticking some money into this type of technology. But it doesn't fit our political folklore around here. Uh, well, we can't have nuclear because of this. But we claim we give a darn about science and technology. When we have some of our smartest people in our society saying we think we have a solution, why don't we actually invest in those solutions instead of investing in the things we keep doing around here where we're investing in technology that's already decades, already out of date? So part of that, my fixation is, reason I bring this chart is there was a member, I think just last week, that was on the floor, and she alluded, she, someone from the left, that the economic growth basically led to more greenhouse gases, more environmental impact. But that's not actually the math. If you actually, and, and we're still working on some of the data for 2019, but if you actually look at 18 and what we're preliminary seeing in 2019, you know, greenhouse gases, the environmental impact went down even though GDP went up dramatically. Why? Because what we did in the tax reform, we actually created this huge incentive to invest in the latest technology. We, we, we allowed you to put in, you could go buy that new technology, you could 100% expense it, and it turned out we were able to create a moment where Economic growth took off, jobs took off, the working poor got dramatically less poor. It was the first couple of years in modern economic times where income inequality shrank. And it shrank because there was opportunity. People's labor became valuable. And oh, guess what? 
Our environment actually got cleaner while growing the economy. We have the proof. We have the data. Isn't this the holy grail that both the left and the right claim they care about? Except the difference is it didn't require a command and control economy. It just required really good technology, the incentives to invest in that technology, and it made a difference. So the other argument we come to the microphone and talk about is there are incredible technology disruptions on the cusp. If we could get our heads around them, we can make some amazing things happen. If we don't get our heads around them, it's going to create economic disruptions. It's going to hurt a lot of people. And we need to understand these. Um, over the last couple of years, I've done some presentations on something called synthetic biology. The reality, it's incredibly hopeful for humanity. It also has some really scary stuff. But here's one, and mark my word, we'll know in, a, in about a decade whether I'm right. I actually believe this piece of technology here will be the single most disruptive technology of our lifetimes. What if I came to you tomorrow and said, we can take plants and make them from mid-20s to 52% more efficient in their growth by tweaking. Now, look, I'm not a plant biologist, um, but I've gone out of my way to read every article, University of Illinois and those who are producing. So you all remember your high school biology class. And let's see if I can get this right. So you had a plant cell, and it really, really, really wants a carbon molecule to turn it into a sugar to grow. But a quirk of nature, it grabs an oxygen molecule. It now has to spend all this energy to purge that and then turn around and grab the carbon so it can grow. What happens is every time it grabs the right molecule to maximize its, its growth? Okay, it looks like we know how, now know how to tweak commodity crops, other crops, to always grab that carbon molecule and grow. Now I need the thought experiment. I need the people around here that all believe we're geniuses to think this through. What happens tomorrow to the value of farmland? What happens to our trade relationships with the world where it's our agriculture you know, muscle as a country when other countries are now able to grow 40% more soybeans on the same land, same water, same fertilizer? Think about the, what's the value of agricultural land? What's the ag value of agricultural debt? This is coming. This technology is here. Are we preparing, thinking what it means? What type of both opportunity does this mean? Because the world already produces more food than it needs. Our real problem is distribution. What happens if tomorrow... Much of the agriculture in the world could produce 40% more on the same piece of land. Well, there is also a quirky piece of math to think about, and that is world agriculture actually is estimated to produce about 2.2 times more greenhouse gases than every car on Earth. So if you were a, an optimistic utopian, this technology is functionally equal to removing every car off the face of the Earth. Yay! That's the positive. But you also got to be ready to deal with the disruption it means economically. And it is coming. But yet, have we ever had a hearing? Have we ever had a discussion? Have we ever invited the scientists to think about, talk us through, have us start to plan economically and, and what it means? Are we going to just do what this place does, which is avoid difficult discussions until it kicks us in the head? So let's talk about healthcare a bit. And obviously, that's my fixation. I come here every week and try to talk about ways we can change. Because before we do this, here's a simple thought experiment. Well, it's not a thought experiment, it's the facts. Obamacare, the ACA, was a financing bill. It was who gets subsidized, who has to pay. Our Republican alternative is a financing bill. It's who has to pay and who gets subsidized. Medicare for all is a financing bill. They don't actually change what the underlying cost of delivering health care is. They just shift around who gets to pay. 
the debate here has to become what we pay. What technology, what models are we going to adopt that change the cost of delivering health care? And so what happens if I come to you and say, 5% of our brothers and sisters have pre-existing conditions. They are suffering. 